Hello, I'm Bob Norton, CEO of Airtight Management and creator of the CEO and Entrepreneur Bootcamp. And welcome to our course or subcourse, Apple, a study in branding. This is part of our overall branding course, and you should have already seen branding segment and maybe the roadmap process of branding segment as well although that's certainly not a prerequisite. I do recommend you see all three before diving into your own branding process, though. So let's talk about Apple. I followed Apple from very early in my career when their first computer came out. As a matter of fact, my first eight years in work was a as a technologist. I started as a software engineer working on the Apple IIe computer back in 1981 at a division of Grumman Aerospace called ISI Systems, which did data processing for the insurance industry. And I got the, the privilege and the opportunity to be sort of the systems programmer, not the application programmer, very quickly for the Apple II computer, which was very new. This was before the IBM PC came out, which I believe was 1983, a year or two later. And so Apple sort of had that to its own, or that market to its own. And it had many innovations that we'll talk about that differentiated it and really set up Apple for the success we see today. So here's a little chart of the evolution of the Apple brand as, it, as its icon or the Apple logo represents Apple. And you can see, no one will probably remember uh, this little thing, but you may remember that uh, if you read Steve Jobs' uh, biography, which I certainly recommend, you may remember he ate a lot of apples and uh, was on sort of a weird diet because of that. In 77 and to 98, when Apple was primarily dependent on the revenue of the Apple II and Apple IIe computer, it was just grabbing hold and getting traction in business, which is why IBM rushed to come to market. That's a whole story in itself and prevent Apple from sort of owning the microcomputer market. Because even at that time, it was very clear to technologists that understood Moore's Law and integrated circuits and everything about CPUs that microcomputers would eventually replace mini computers and mainframes that cost a fortune. As a matter of fact, in 1986, I convinced my company to create one of the first blade server racks, and we replaced hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of deck mini computers that needed full-time operators and raised floors and uh, halon approval permits from the city and all of this other stuff. And we replaced it with a rack of six PCs that had the equivalent or actually superior processing power uh, to those multi-hundred thousand dollar uh, VAX computers at the time. So Apple had a product lead that was pretty amazing, and we'll talk about that, but they had the first disk drive. It was only 143K bytes, which is pretty laughable by today's standard, right? It's not even a good picture today. Uh, it had a graphics display where most of the other ones were uh, just doing text displays. Uh, it supported color and other things, and so it could hook up to a color monitor at one point. And it was easily upgraded with slots, which was a new concept at the time, so that third parties could develop hardware that would interface and connect directly into the bus of the Apple computer. And so for an entire, this entire period in the top row, and, and probably up until 2000 when the iPod came out, Apple was essentially just a personal computer company, and they had very little that didn't have to do with that. But starting in 2000, they really started to transition into a consumer products company. And God knows, only in, inside Apple people know of how far their plans were known uh, as this would evolve to the iPad and 
the iTunes store and the iPhone and, and, and all of those other products coming out over time, you know, essentially accomplishing some things that were considered science fiction. So back then, from 76 to 98, Apple, Apple IIe was really the cash cow of that business and drove it. And in fact, it's very easy to make the argument that without the success of that product, Apple would have gone bankrupt because they had many product failures after that, the first of which was the Apple Lisa, named after uh, Steve Jobs' daughter. You know, I'm sure you've seen in the, uh, in the documentaries on Steve Jobs. And it sold for about 4000 I'm sorry, about equivalent in today's dollars, it would be $26,000 that it sold for, even though that was 9995 back then. So even back then, Apple knew how to overprice its products and had a lot of ego and a lot of belief that it could position itself as upscale. At the time that this came out in 83 when the IBM PC came out, the IBM PC was probably selling for $3,000. I remember buying an IBM AT, which was their upgrade from the 8088 computer, I believe, to the 8086. CPU from Intel at the time, and, and most of them were about $3,000. So they were pricing at literally three times what the competition was uh, with this, which made it an undesirable product, to say the least. But it had a huge leap forward in the GUI because they were the first one in two years before Microsoft to come out with a graphical user interface. Of course, as any story, uh, historian knows, those ideas were stolen from Xerox PARC, which developed the mouse and the idea of a gra graphical interface. Now, at the time the Lisa came out, they also released the first sort of consumer hard drive, which you see sitting on top of the, uh, of the Lisa here. That's a five megabyte computer, which again, not more than one high quality picture today could fit on that. So laughable in today's standards, when you can have 256 gigabytes on your keychain. But nevertheless, a highly differentiated advanced product for its time. And the combination of this hardware and what was called the killer app, which was VisiCalc, the very first spreadsheet, which was then later dominated by Lotus 123 and then Excel later. But the, the VisiCalc was really the killer app and it sold an awful lot, probably millions of these Apple IIEs to companies that wanted to do accounting and very basic stuff because the spreadsheet was sort of the first general purpose application that could do almost anything you wanted with numbers. So these huge leaps that were built into the Apple IIE combined with having some of these killer apps Excel or a spreadsheet and, and uh, Lotus 123 and VisiCalc just being a few of the early examples in one space, but I believe they went to thousands of applications pretty quickly in the first five years or so after the Apple IIe came out and essentially created a cottage industry, which turned into a massive industry of software development for the microcomputer. So here's a look at the, the stock price of what was happening to Apple. And, and you'll see that it broke out in May, and, and this was during the announcement uh, in 2008, of its beginning to move from just being a computer company uh, to announcing the iPod, which was the first consumer product that, that was not uh, just a general purpose computer. So massive things started happening then. And of course, Steve Jobs had come back at that point in time, simplified the product line. Frankly, he became a decent CEO after he got thrown out of Apple. He was not a good executive and didn't play well with others. And, and even after he came back, he didn't play that well with others, everyone says. But the idea is that when he did next, the computer company, as well as Pixar, he really learned to be a better executive and CEO and manager. And all those skills that entrepreneurs uh, don't have, 
because they, they need to get those things from experiential. It's all about experiential learning. But Steve was a real master. And you'll see that the stock price doubled in just the nine months because Wall Street and the financial community started seeing the opportunity of how microcomputers or microprocessors specifically were going to start getting embedded in a lot of consumer products. And so the market, the total addressable market that Apple was going after, going from a PC company to a consumer products company, probably got multiplied by a factor of 100 or more. It could even be a factor of 1,000. So you may remember this iconic ad of this person uh, running in, in shorts. This was a spinoff of the idea from George Orwell. And it positioned Apple as the little guy against the big bad IBM or Big Blue. And she ran into an audience of people that were all dressed in black. You can probably replay this on, on YouTube, and it's worth seeing. Uh, to show that she was throwing the sledgehammer to break the screen that was oozing propaganda. And the emotional branding message here was that IBM was the big evil propaganda machine that controlled the market. And Apple, of course, was the think different, new, young, sexy, uh, lots more going on. And so I'm sure they spent a lot of time figuring out and casting this role for this person to be appropriate to convey the Apple brand. She's athletic. She's attractive. She's got a short haircut. She's, you know, certainly trying to convey the Apple brand, right? Today we celebrate the first glorious anniversary of the information purification of a garden of pure ideology, where each worker may bloom, secure from the pests, forgetting comfort of the fruits. The woods is more powerful of the women in its needs, or are the other. We are one people, with one will, one resolve, one cause. On January 24th, Apple Computer will introduce Macintosh. And you'll see why 1984 won't be like 1984.